Hello. Happy Thanksgiving. I am not a famous person, but I am here today with the true star of the day, a turkey. Today, I would like to read a classic 19th century story, a story of the holiday, a story of Thanksgiving, a story of togetherness, a story of terror. Join us today as we read a tale of terror right here on Living History's Mysteries. Let's get started. As Americans gather for the Thanksgiving holiday, it is perhaps time to turn the clock back to one family feast that did not raise quite as much cheer. It tells of the terrible incidents that took place in a house in Oakville, Georgia, USA, in the latter part of the 19th century. This spot land earned a high place amongst haunted localities, and in its day was comparable with the famous house in Berkeley Square. Situated in the midst of picturesque but lonely country, this house, the property of a farmer named Walsingham, had a worldwide reputation amongst physical investigators. For some time, the house had been left deserted by its owner, and it would seem that during the temporary absence of its material master, it passed into the hands of beings or forces, call them what you will, who wished to remain in undisputed possession. When Walsingham and his family decided to return and take up their abode in the house, they were struck on the very first day by the peculiar feeling of the place. They could not decide in any way what this feeling was, but on analysis, likened it to claustrophobia, an overpowering dread of being alone within any four walls. Their dog, Don Caesar absolutely refused to enter the house. On being dragged in, he immediately broke out into ferocious barking. His back hairs bristled with rage and he showed every sign of terror. This occurred several times during the day and the same evening being attracted to the spot by his whines and howls, Walsingham saw his dog attacking some invisible enemy Don Caesar at last sprang in the air as if at a man's throat, but fell back as if he had received a heavy blow. When picked up, he found Don Caesar's neck had been broken. The Walsingham's cat, on the other hand, manifested every sign of delight at being in this house. It strolled from room to room, purring loudly, and was even seen on several occasions twisting his head from side to side and arching his back as if someone was stroking him. To say that the Walsinghams were amazed at these things would be to describe their feelings mildly. They were very much upset but had not as yet any suspicion on the score of supernatural causes. But that evening, just towards the dusk, the house was suddenly filled with shouts, groans, and hideous laughter heard by all the occupants and putting them into a veritable panic. Miss Amelia Walsingham, while sitting in front of her mirror, saw a man's hand upon her shoulder. Yet there was no reflection of it in the glass, nor was there any arm or body apparent. Walsingham himself saw footprints forming in the dust of the garden path right before his very eyes as he walked, yet no mortal could be seen. But though these things were uncanny and terrifying, and there were sufficient to make the family realize that some force out of the usual was at work, they paled in insignificance before the later incidents which took place during the evening giving of thanks meal. The family was seated at the sup table 
with guests to celebrate the giving of thanks holiday when their conversation was suddenly interrupted by a loud and horrible groan uttered apparently in the room above. Little notice was taken of it until one of the guests pointed out that a stain of what looked to be blood on the tablecloth and it seen some liquid slowly dripping from the ceiling overhead. This liquid was so much like freshly shed blood as to horrify those who witnessed its slow dripping. It would be hard to imagine a more gruesome occurrence at any time, let alone on this, the holiday of the giving of thanks. But the peculiar form of this horror and its theatrical way in which it was carried out would put it down as the invention of some most evil-minded but decidingly clever person. It flashed into the minds of all sitting at the table that some terrible deed had been committed in the room above, some frightful murder. For a few seconds all sat silent with white faces looking out of the corners of their eyes at each other in terror. Then Walsingham shook off his paralysis of fear and ran out of the room followed by his son. They went quickly upstairs to the room over the dining room and flung the door open dreading what fearful sight their eyes should meet. But it was empty. Father and son quickly tore up the carpet and there found the boards to be soaked with the same red, gruesome liquid as was dripping into the room beneath. But there was no explanation, nor was any afterwards discovered. The liquid was later examined under a microscope by a medical man and pronounced to be human blood. This incident was too much for the Walshinghams and they left the house and removed to another. Walshingham House then fell into entire disuse and stories of the occurrences being put abroad. The place was shunned by day as well as night. This neglect did not tend to make the spot look more cheerful. And it is stated that in addition to the gloom that generally settles on the most ordinary of empty houses, there was an undoubted feeling of depression in the air around this place. Quite normal people said that it felt to them as if the atmosphere of the locality weighed more than anywhere else. Fast forward several decades, the house had not been approached in several years when a young man named Horace Gunn made it the subject of a wager, betting a friend a fair sum of money that he would stay alone in the house for one night and have no aid within call. This enthusiastic young man carried out his intention and went to the house one evening before it was dark. His story is best told in his own words. I had been in the house about an hour and nothing had happened. It was just beginning to get dark and I thought that I would set about lighting a fire. Though I do not consider myself an expert in this art, I was very much surprised at being absolutely unable to do so. My matches went out one after another as if blown out by a strong draft. Once when I had succeeded in lighting a piece of paper, it only smoldered for a few seconds and then went out. This was bad enough as though I had to give up the idea of a cheerful blaze to keep me company. But to my disgust, I found that my lamp would not light either. It was as if it were filled with water instead of whale oil. It was now quite dark and whilst I was looking about for some means of getting a light, there came a terrible yell of pain from beneath the house and this was the signal for an outbreak of the most hideous and devilish noises. There were shouts and screams, groans, laughter, thumping, and all the continual running up and down the stairs of several heavily shod people. My hair bristled. I stood by the window, practically paralyzed with fear, 
and I had then been able to control my limbs, I would have fled that house. I would have lost my wager and a hundred like it rather to stay in that haunt of fiends. Then suddenly the noises stopped. Complete silence fell on the place. But far from reassuring me, this made matters worse, for now I dreaded the silence even more than I had the ghostly noises. All the time I listened, listened for something. Now and then I thought I heard the soft footsteps drawing near me, but it was nothing. This waiting, dreading was far worse than the pandemonium of terror. I did not have long to wait for the next move, for in the darkness there suddenly appeared a small spot of grayish light on the wall opposite me. It grew larger and larger, altering in shape until it assumed the outline of a human head. At the same time, losing its flatness, soon it was just that, a real human head, dishuffled and severed from a body floating in the air. Its hair was long and gray and matted together, and it had a deep and jagged cut in one temple. The whole face indicated suffering and misery. The eyes were wide open and gleaming with an unearthly fire while they seemed to directly gaze up on me. The head moved about the room, but always the eyes were turned in my direction. But then it vanished. But there broke out in the room a loud and awe-inspiring wail as of several souls in anguish. I thought then that I could see indistinct shapes flitting about and mustering up all my courage, I attempted to pass them to gain the door. But just as I reached it, I felt my ankle seized in a firm grasp and I was thrown down and felt fingers grasping upon my throat. At this point, Mr. Gunn's story ceases. He was found by his friends the next morning unconscious on the floor by the door and bearing on his throat the marks of long, thin fingers with cruel, curved nails. After this experience, no one was found to have anything more to do with the house, though a few people interested in such matters attempted to find out some reason for this terrible haunting. Though several avenues of investigation were explored, nothing very conclusive was ever discovered. The house had by this time acquired such an evil reputation that no one would occupy it, and it was ultimately demolished. Upon demolishing this evil home, Many doctors were called to the site as human bones were found under the house and in its grounds. How they came there was never known, but it was supposed that they had been laying there for many years and were the bones of people who might have been murdered when the house was a roadside inn of very bad repute. And herein perhaps lies an explanation for the hauntings at the house. A few days before returning to his house, Mr. Walsingham had discovered in the ground some old dried bones, and not able to decide whether they were human or not, settled this matter as he thought by ordering them to be thrown into his lime kiln. It is possible that the spirits of the men whose bones so indecently treated summoned to their aid certain dark forces in order to make the place uninhabitable by mortals in revenge for the insult offered to their remains. My God, that is a classic tale of terror. I'd like to thank you for joining us for this tale of terror on Thanksgiving Day, a true tale of togetherness. As always, I'd like to ask you to please share this video out. 
like-minded people, friends who love the paranormal, the historic, or the parahistoric. As always, I'd like to ask you to subscribe. It's free. It doesn't cost anything to subscribe. And don't forget. Really? Ring that bell. That way you'll know when new videos come out and we prove time and time again. You never know what we're going to talk about. So again, I am not a famous person. But he is. Take care of yourselves. Take care of each other. God bless you. God love you, we do. And we'll see you down the road. Got any dinner plans?